Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to Fantasy Friday. So today we will be reading another two chapters from The Tiger and the Wolf by Adrian Tchaikovsky. Last week we saw Manny being pursued by Broken Axe through the cold of the north. It's snowing now, and despite Manny continuing to say that it is not true winter yet, she is starting to struggle a little bit, especially with Hesperic and Toe, because he's from the south where it's nice and warm, and he's a snake. He's not really conditioned to the cold. So let's see how they get along, and perhaps we'll even revisit Asmander and his crew as we start with chapter number 13. The horse people at the trading post on the Sotek were surprised to see them. Asmander had the impression that, give it another two or three days, they'd none of them still be there. There was one final raft of logs rocking at the crude quay, and they were busy loading it with everything that could be carried, leaving just the hollow stockade behind. The local hetman, another tough and compact little horsewoman, obviously thought little of Eshmir and her journey. Asmander learned a great deal by watching the two of them talk, as the new arrivals enjoyed the fire's warmth in the post's only hut. It was not about what was said, all of which was very comradely, comradely, but about the way they sat and the distance between them, the attitude of their arms and shoulders. Rival clans, Asmander knew, without any doubt at all. The horse society's strength was its unity. That was what everyone knew about them. A network of trade and talk and travel from the northern ice to the southern banks of the Sotek. It was fascinating to see the cracks. At last, some northern natives were located and brought forward. They looked a sorry lot. On the one hand, a man and woman in furs and wool, each with a pack that looked half as big as they were, and neither of them looking young enough to be tramping through the wilderness in winter. The third was a small man with half his face tattooed or painted black, so that one eye stared out of that mask like a mad, trapped thing, while the other was creased with sardonic humor. He wore dark clothes, a woolen robe that looked almost priestly, with a heavy quilted cloak over it. All three had those flat northern faces, skin the color of wet sand, high cheekbones, and eyes that seemed constantly suspicious of everything. The man and his trade wife are coyote, Eshmir explained. The others crow from the eerie. They're better than nothing. How much? Asmander asked her. Enough. They will guide us to the many mouths. Failed traders got here too late after all the pickings had gone. They're luckier to get us than we are to get them. You fill me full of confidence, he remarked. At his shoulder, Venator snorted. They're no fighters! I hope we shall need no fighters. With the winter coming on, there will be few others abroad, I'm assured. Assuming these natives don't lead us into an ambush, Asmander put in, almost cheerily. Eshmir gave him a pained look. We leave come the morning, she informed him. Everyone else was leaving under the same dawn. The local horse traders cast off their final raft after a stilted exchange of well-wishings with Eshmir. The new arrivals were left in sole control of the stockade. Eshmir and her people wanted to leave at once, but the three guides had apparently been conspiring, and they insisted that everyone sit and talk over the journey, which meant heading back into the hut. The Coyote Man who had perhaps the least trustworthy face Asmander had ever seen, was their main speaker, and his given name was Two Heads, which turned out to be short for Two Heads Talking, in that peculiar northern fashion for names. Even though he had already sworn his agreement over guiding them, Two Heads was suspicious. First, he wanted to know why Eshmir wanted to go to the Many Mouths, who he claimed would not be pleased to see her. Everyone is glad of the horse society, she replied implacably. Wolves from all over the crown of the world have come to the many mouths, 
two heads went on. You have chosen an unlucky season. You should come next year. We're here now, Venator grunted, ignoring a look from Eshmir that said she wanted to do the talking. Piss on next year! Seven skins, the high chief. He passes, the coyote explained, spreading his hands helplessly. Not a good time for strangers to come near the jaws of the wolf, or anywhere in the wolf's shadow. Me and mine, we go where we will, but horse? And these? An incredulous nod towards the southerners. Pull up or piss off! was Venator's sharp response. Nonetheless, we must travel, Eshmir tried unsuccessfully to talk over him. She glanced at Asmander. We all have our duty. <laughs> of course we will take you. This was the crow man with his half-darkened face. Currently, he was eyeing them with the unpainted half, the other eye glowering past them at the sloping roof. You must always have gifts for the road, though. You horse, you always carry gifts. You've had your price. Eshmir told him flatly. The currency had not been coin, which apparently was something alien to the cold north, but in future favors from the horse. We? Yes, yes. The crow bobbed his head. There will be others. The hetman said nobody travels in winter, Eshmir stated, nothing in her face acknowledging how foolish that made her own mission sound. Winter? The crow chuckled deep in his throat. This is not winter. If we are not with the many mouths when true winter comes, then you will all die. And you? Asmander asked, not as a challenge, but from genuine curiosity. I, black man, I shall fly away. There were only two steeds left for them, so Eshmir and one of her people would get a ride, and the rest must walk. Their supplies, a reluctant gift from the outgoing horse Hetman, were distributed over every set of shoulders that would consent to bear them, which meant everyone except Venator. How do you get to go without? Shiri asked him. Then she cast a look at Asmander, with a flash of white teeth. You have a disobedient slave! Venator lunged for her, utterly without warning, and yet she slipped beyond his clawing grasp. Are you not his slave? she asked delightedly, her voice bouncing back from the inside of the stockade. I'm no man's slave, the pirate spat. Then what are you, old man? Asmander watched with interest as the pirate tried twice to answer her, murder glinting in his eyes. He is mine! the champion announced at last, when Venator had suffered long enough. That is all. For just so long, Venator got out. And then I will be my own again, and I will have my name back, and then I will kill you. I will. The others, especially the three northerners, stared, because what was going on was something they simply did not do. Not here where names were cheap, and they did not understand. Chiefly, they could not understand the sudden warmth of Asmander's smile. You will try, he agreed. And, who knows, perhaps this time you will succeed. Venator's stony eyes flicked away from him to their audience, then to Shiri. So what? You'll make me your pack dog? Never! Asmander assured him, his smile still there, but hard. I've loaded you with so much weight already that another grain of corn might break you. He never knew the precise limits of Venator's temper. Surely there was a point where the man would just snap, fly into the mad rage he had once been famed for, and so give up any chance of reclaiming his name and his soul from Asmander's keeping. For a second, those eyes seemed desperate, hunted, lost. 
The look in them was such that Asmander regretted his words, because he had never been one to find joy in torture. Then, incredibly, the man's teeth were bared in a hard crescent. Oh, boy, I'm stronger than you know. And the hurt was gone, and then they were grinning at each other. Look at what we've learned about each other. But I'll still not carry for you. The expressions of the others, when Asmander looked around them, were utterly bewildered, profoundly disturbed. All except Shiri. She had been mightily entertained, he saw. The laughing men did not care about understanding others. That was her secret. He envied her the contentment it must bring. Once on the road, he placed himself at the front, beside two heads talking and his trade wife, whatever that was. They regarded him warily, as though he might suddenly do anything, he supposed. He was the alien in their midst, a man of different skin and shape and customs. But tell me, he addressed them, if the wolves are so dangerous to outsiders, why go there yourself? Surely the horse's favor cannot be worth endangering your skins. Or are coyotes enough like to wolves for you to avoid their wrath? Two heads regarded him morosely. We need to be somewhere for winter. We come to the horse too late, and now home's too far. At least your horsewoman will get us in amongst the many mouths. Winter has more teeth than all the wolves in the world. Never say a coyote is a wolf, his wife spoke up. But in their eyes, we're not worth shedding blood for. She grinned fairly. Not when they've got you. The attack came three days later, when they were all worn down from journeying and numb from the cold. There had been snow the day before though light enough that Two Heads Talking had devised simply pressing on. On the morning that they fought, the sky was utterly clear, a pale blue that Asmander had never seen before. Their guides were earning their keep, whilst Two Heads led the way, his trade wife, her northern name was quiet when loud, was forever straying off and coming back with game or even fish. The crow cooked and tended the fire, and while they were camped he sometimes sang, strange wordless songs that made the hairs stand up on the back of Asmander's neck. He went by the name of Ragged Sky, but by now Asmander had worked out that they each of them had another name, a real name, that they did not share with mere strangers. They were an untrusting people here in the crown of the world, keeping their names in darkness. That day, Asmander had noticed a number of large birds dark against that strange sky, but had thought nothing of it. In truth, he needed most of his concentration focused on the ground. This crown of the world was the most jagged country he had ever seen, as though great spirits had broken it apart with hammers in ancient times, and then some of it had grown over with grass and thick stands of slope-bowed trees. Water wormed through it everywhere, and much of the time their path was along the cut of some stream bed. Right now they were ascending, in steps and lurches, along the channel that a river had carved into a steep hillside, the water's work making the unscalable into the merely laborious. The flow of water itself had atrophied to little more than a brook, the result of the oncoming freeze creeping down on them from the north. With the rocky ground rising away from them on both sides, this was the obvious point for an ambush. Even before the trouble started, Asmander found himself feeling tense. Ahead of him, the stomping form of Venator already had his moret to hand, weighing its comforting heft with every step. Then Ragged Sky appeared alongside Eshmir's horse, tugging at her boot as she guided the animal over the uneven ground. You should have your gifts ready, he advised. You will need them. Two heads talking shot him a sharp look and then cocked an eye towards the sky. 
He put his fingers to his mouth and gave a piercing whistle. For a moment, Asmander thought he was actually calling down the ambush there and then. Only quiet when loud came at his summons, leaping and bounding down the slope in her skinny little dog-like shape, before stepping back into human form beside him. Asmander took up his macan, resting the flat of the toothed wooden blade on his shoulder. Their three guides were plainly tense, but not enough to suggest that they were about to fight for their lives. Pirates! Venator declared, and Asmander nodded. That was the business with the gifts, of course. Whoever was about to make themselves known could apparently be bought off. At that moment, there came a sound out of the sky, starting just beyond the limit of hearing and building swiftly into a saw-edged shriek that split the ears. Asmander looked out wildly, ducking aside as one of the horses started stamping and plunging, its rider sliding off it, but still holding tight to the reins. Some of the horse had their bows strung, but the strange sound ripped into them, making them cluster together, fumbling their arrows. Another high-pitched, savage voice joined the throng, and then a third. They came from above and all around, and Asmander saw those winged shapes passing and repassing, stooping from on high and then climbing back into the cold and cloudless heavens. Abruptly, they started dropping down on all sides of the travelers, to end up perched on rocks and outcroppings overlooking the riverbed. They swooped with negligent speed, the nerve-shredding screaming arriving with them, stopping as they stopped. They came down as hawks, but when they landed, it was as men. They were harsh-looking and barbarous creatures, to Asmander's eyes. They were still northerners, but their faces were craggier, with sharper noses and mad staring eyes. Like ragged sky, each had half his face painted, but they had used jagged patterns of black and red and white, so that, when they glared with the eye on that side, it seemed to be at the center of a storm. They wore surprisingly little despite the cold. Cloaks and breeches, their bare chests painted with designs of lightning and wings and eyes. Some had bracers and greaves and long hauberks, all made of ranks of bones laced together. For weapons they carried spears and curved war clubs with vicious bronze beaks. Many had odd lengths of wood strapped to their ankles, cut with holes like flutes. With a sudden understanding, Asmander realized that these must be the source of that terrifying sound as they dropped through the air. The horse had formed a solid group, standing back to back. Asmander, Venator, and Shiri were each on their own, looking for room to fight. Eshmir stepped forward, apparently to address the newcomers, but two heads talking quickly gestured for her to stop. Do I see Yellow Claw? He called out to the newcomers, and then, These are his warband, are they not? Where is he? For a moment, all fell still, the newcomers staring at them from their painted eyes, spears and clubs at the ready. Then a shadow passed over them all, and a vast winged form circled close overhead, before displacing one of the raiders to claim his perch. It was white as the snow, and whilst the hawk shapes of the others had seemed smaller than their human forms, this bird could have looked Asmander in the eye. It was surely large enough to carry away a man in its talons. A champion among birds, he realized, awed by the thought. When it fixed a single orange eye upon him, he had to work hard to face up to that burning regard. Then it was a man in armor of bones and claws and quills. Curving struts of wood, thick with feathers, jutted above his shoulders, so that even standing on human feet, he was winged. You sully my name, old dog! He reproached two heads, and then, as a kind of formal announcement to the rest of them, I am Yellow Claw! I swoop on man and bear alike! In the wake of my wings I hear the cries of my enemies, and the wailing of their women. 
Venator made a small sound that was a surprisingly subtle indication that he was not overfond of Yellowclaw. Yellowclaw, these travelers of the Horse Society are not enemies of the Eerie, two heads went on, speaking quickly. They simply pass through these lands, as the horse often does. I know even the eerie trades with the horse. Yellowclaw cast a sour look towards Ragged Sky, who had been staying very still and silent. Let the bone pickers do whatever they wish. Then we permit them to reside under the shadow of our wings is more than they deserve. He hopped to another perch, his men moving around him watching for his lead. But these are not my enemies, you say? No, indeed, Yellowclaw. What can they be, then? He thrust out a bare foot and walked onto thin air. In that instant he had stepped, his colossal wingspan blotting out the sun for a moment as he ghosted down to them, becoming a man again as he reached the ground. The buffeting of his wings rocked the travelers. Friends, with gifts, Eshmir explained, but Yellowclaw looked through her as though she was not there. Only when two heads echoed her words did the eerie men appear to hear them. Show me these gifts! He was easily close enough for Asmander to attack him. Worse, he was close enough for Venator to do so. Which seemed more likely. There was a confidence about the man, like stone, though... He stood there before them fully armored in his belief in himself, in his status as a champion. If I step? But Asmander knew the answer to that. It would be a challenge to this yellow claw that he could not ignore, and I don't think even my vaunted honor will give me wings to match his. He had no idea how these eerie men lived, or what flaws held them back from being a power like the wolf. Or... Perhaps they were so, in other parts of the crown. He was finding his ignorance pressing in on him from all sides. The gifts were some gold work from the south, some turquoise and jade. None of it seemed notable to Asmander's eyes, but he guessed it seemed exotic enough when brought to these cold places. Yellowclaw looked at it all derisively, but he nevertheless snatched it from the two heads talking in a single swift motion. Then he went stalking over to stare at the southerners. Black man, he noted. Why are you here, black man from the south? Drawn by the wonders of the north, Asmander told him. Yellowclaw stared at him, first with one eye and then the other. War, peace. War, peace. He turned back to two heads. You have many women here, two heads talking he noted. The coyote held himself quite still. Not really so many. More than enough for an old man. Too many, perhaps. Gifts, you said. It was not reassuring to see the sudden hunted expression appear on their guide's face. Ragged Sky had started shuffling away from the others, too, as though trying to deny any connection. Y yellow claw? Two heads started. His hand reached out and found his wife's. I know quiet when loud. She is funny, Yellowclaw observed. Quiet when loud, loud when quiet. I know her. I do not insult you to suggest I seize on her. But so many women, horse women, plains women. Yellowclaw knows the ways of the horse society, Two Heads said carefully. You walk under my skies, Two Heads. This is a hard season for traveling. It is good that you have gifts. Gift me a woman, Two Heads talking. Then you may have the blessing of the Eerie for a year and a day. Two Heads' eyes flicked from Yellowclaw to Eshmir. They, they, they... They are not in my gift. If they are not yours, then they are for the taking, Yellowclaw suggested, his voice softly dangerous. Surely so one so great as Yellowclaw has many mates already, Shuri's voice broke in. 
When the eerie men did not seem to hear her, she prompted, Tell him that, dog man! Stuttering a little, two heads did so. Yellowclaw laughed, flashing bright teeth. Ah, yes, my nest is well feathered! But I have many followers, and some must return to a cold bed. Look at them! A broad gesture towards the predatory gathering around them. Have pity, two heads, and share your bounty! Have him pick one such, and I shall wrestle him, Shiri intervened. If he beats me, say I'll go with him. If he cannot beat me, he's no man, and I'll have none of him. The coyote opened his mouth, but that boast was apparently too amusing for Yellowclaw to ignore. He regarded Shiri with his disparate gazes, and laughed again. Oshkir, come down here. Your wife wants to know you. One of the eerie men, younger, but still a broad-shouldered, strong-framed man, jumped up, stepping at the apex of his leap, and then feathering his way down to stand as a man by Yellowclaw's side. You'll go with him, will you? Asmander murmured to Shiri. We don't all have your honor, champion, nor do we all keep our word, she growled back. You're lucky that I don't intend to lose. She strode forwards, a match for this Os Oshkir in height, but more slender. Yellowclaw clapped his protege on the back. Go teach your wife, he told him. The man leapt at Shiri in that moment, obviously planning to make a quick end of it. She threw herself aside, stepping for an extra burst of speed, and then regarded him again from out of reach. There was a current of jeering laughter from among the eerie men. Watch out! She has an ugly side! One of them called. Oshkir scowled, and then he darted forwards again. Even as Shiri came to meet him with teeth and claws, he himself had stepped, rising above her and then plunging back down. For a moment, he had his claws hooking at her back, but she stepped sinuously back into her human shape, his talons merely gouging her coat. Briefly, he was snarled there, beating his wings hard enough to yank her off balance. Then she slipped out of it, down to a sleeveless tunic, and he wheeled away, almost clashing her wing, his wings against the rocky ground, and stepping down to face her, man to woman. There were more exclamations from the eerie men, some mocking their fellow, others in loud speculation about how much more of Shiri would be revealed by the end of the contest. After his initial rash onslaught, Oshkir was apparently learning some wisdom, keeping his distance, even backing up alongside the river channel. A moment later, he had kicked off, stepped, and was diving on her again with wings outstretched. The first time she stepped and warned him off with her bared jaws, forcing him to pull up awkwardly, faltering in the air. Yellowclaw found it hilarious. We'll need a collar and a muzzle for her when we get back he called out. Then Oshkir dropped back into his human shape, even as he fell on her, trusting to his greater weight and the speed of impact to break her. For a moment, Asmander thought he had succeeded, as Shiri seemed to fall beneath him, but then they were grappling, and she was holding him off, matching strength to strength, to Oshkir's obvious astonishment. He grimaced and put the... Uh, he grimaced and put his awl into the next shove, trying to force her off balance. To Asmander, the Eerieman's youth and inexperience practically screamed out. Shiri had been waiting for it. She melted away before him, kicking his front leg out as he shoved, so that Oshkir hurtled head over heels past her, tumbling into the shallow draft of the river. She was on him instantly, smacking his face into the water and then reaching an arm about his neck. For a second, there was a winged thing struggling for flight there, but then she had her hold, and he was a man again, straining and struggling to remove her arm. Asmander watched thoughtfully as she locked her legs about his waist and began the careful business of strangling him. He had thought Yellowclaw would make some move to halt the fight, but either he reckoned Oshkir was due for some humiliation, or the spectacle of one of his warriors being beaten by a woman had rendered him speechless. Strange are the ways of the North, or of the Eerie, anyway, he considered. 
Not unique, certainly, but the traditions of the Laughing Men were certainly a rude shock to these locals. From what Asmander remembered, the men of that tribe had been allowed little enough to laugh about. Oshkir had gone purple, eyes bulging, and abruptly his body went limp, head lolling. Shiri released him, then kicked him over, none too gently, to keep his face out of the water. This is no man, she announced. You have sent me one of your children. For a moment, all was still, and Asmander could read something of Yellowclaw's conflicting thoughts, his desire to avenge his people struggling against the deal he had made openly before them. At the last, he laughed, although it sounded forced. Another year before you earn your name, Oshkir. Though that surely fell on deaf ears. The other Eerie sent up a half-hearted murmur in support. Go, two heads talking, Yellowclaw waved dismissively. Take your amusing wife and your amusing friends. Take them far off. The coyote nodded hastily, looking as though he was surprised to still be alive, and, under the stern regard of the Eerie, the travelers got under way with as much haste as they could muster. And that concludes chapter number 13. So, let's check back in with Manny and see how she's doing in chapter 14. Manny tried to break south, heading away from the lake, but Broken Axe was a man who had lived a hunter's life, two feet or four. He was already putting on a burst of speed that would lead her into his jaws as she tried to veer away from the water, cutting a long, curved line as though he and the lake together made a pack that was closing her in, shutting down her options just like the prey she was. She was fast, but she was hungry and tired and carrying a burden. Broken Axe loped along, sparing his strength, knowing that no matter how she dodged and turned, he would run her down with the wolf's patient endurance. The sheer impersonal calm of the man was more frightening than slavering rage might have been. The chase was nothing special, just one of hundreds for him. When he brought her down, to tear out her throat or to drag her home, he would not exalt, nor even much care. One more quarry, that was all she was. This thought gave her access to a hitherto unsuspected surge of strength, and she pulled ahead, springing away from the water and into the trees, hoping she might lose him again. But this time there was no enshrouding snow to aid her. Even if she could put enough trees between them, her tracks would be his road towards her. And he was still on her heels. She could hear the regular panting of his breath, almost feel the heat of it on her haunches. The crisp thud of his footfalls in the snow were so very close. There was panic in her heart, and she could not but give it rein, letting it whip her faster and faster. She would tire, she knew, but she did not have the ability to pace herself. That was a luxury so seldom granted to prey. She twice tried to cut back south, desperately hoping to barter a brief burst of speed into something that would do her some good. He was there both times, mouth open in a wolf's easy grin heading her away, making all the decisions over where this chase was going. Somehow she was able to form the cogent thought, He knows the ground already! There was not a hand span of the crown of the world that had not known Broken Axe's tread. Even with the snow masking the telltale scents and muddling the scenery, he knew where he was. He was forcing her to head exactly where he wanted her, as a shepherd would nip at the edges of his flock, and she could do nothing to stop him. The going was harder now, and she understood that Broken Axe was forcing her uphill, tiring her out further while he himself just dipped into what seemed an inexhaustible well of ready strength. The ground underfoot became more uneven, riven by stones and outcroppings of rock that the snow turned into ankle-breaking traps for the unwary. She kept her eyes ahead, legs still pounding away as she leapt and shouldered her way through the snow, burning with exhaustion a little more with each breath. The skew and disposition of the trees ahead were a hidden language telling her where the rock lay, where the ground was earth and roots. She spurred herself on, scrabbling and darting. Every time a tree passed on either side, she cast herself that way, trying to put obstacles in his path. He did not seem overly concerned. 
Sometimes he was almost abreast of her, his sinuous progress at the corner of her vision, on the left or the right, steering her adroitly by the menace of his very presence. For him, the trees and rocks might almost not have been there. Then she saw, ahead, where the land would call a halt to the chase, where she, exhausted and terrified, would be brought to bay against a wall of upthrust grey stone. As though a god's stroke had severed the earth, the shallow, uneven rise that he had been hounding her up met with a weathered and cracked cliff face, three times the height of a tall man. The barrier extended on either side as far as she could see, a grey gash in the white expanse of the world. Only now did she know how close she was to the uplands, because here they were. This was where the wolf's shadow grew fainter. Here were the first few jagged points that lined the northern edge of the crown of the world. Here was where Broken Axe sought to break her. He was even slowing down, letting her dash herself against the rocks, letting her drive out the last few sparks of defiance that still burned in her. She increased her speed, and for the first time had the sense that she had caught him off guard. The stone loomed over her, as though it would crash down and obliterate all trace that there had ever been such a thing as Maniyi, Stone River's daughter. A plan formed in her head. A mad plan, but the sane ones had all failed her. There was no wolf test at which she would better broken axe, but she could do something he could not. This cannot work. But... She guessed that Broken Axe had not been interested in the testing. Certainly, he was not the sort to engage in idle gossip with the Winter Runners, and there were drawbacks in being a man alone. But it was very high, and she had never tried something like this. She stepped. For a moment, her pounding paws became feet in horse-gifted hide boots, going far too fast for a human, about to trip over herself and plant her face straight in that rough spread of stone. She jumped kicking off with all her strength, and as soon as she had cleared the ground, she was a wolf again. It was Broken Axe's trick to leap the stream. The distance her human strength would throw her human body was far less than it would throw the smaller wolf that she became. For a second, she was a terrified animal, scrabbling at the rock face. She had already worked through the sequence in her mind. In the next eye blink, she let her tiger out its claws already hooking at whatever chink or fracture the rock would grant her, finding impossible purchase for a half-breath that would let her rake her way uh, higher up the stone. She sensed Broken Axe at her very tail, leaping up with jaws bared, but falling away, falling short of her. Her satchel strap snapped, and for a moment she felt sure that she would lose Hesbrook again, and that he would fall into the waiting teeth of the hunter. Something like a chill whip coiled about her shoulder, though, and she knew he had lashed himself close to her for all his old snake body was worth. Then her battle with the stone and with the yawning pull of the earth below consumed all her attention. She was fighting for a hold with all four feet, lurching upwards in uneven bursts, knowing that to fail was to fall. Her enemy was waiting to tear into her the moment she allowed him to. But it was for her to allow. For the first time, she was in control. She would succeed or fail by her own merits, not merely fall victim to Broken Axe's long-learned skills. Then, halfway up, she lost her purchase and felt herself parting company with the treacherous rock face, almost as if it was shaking her off. She felt herself in fierce contention with its stone spirit, the stubborn and uncooperative entity that slumbered within it. Then it had shuddered, like a vast beast that feels the itching of some insect on its hide and she was falling. She twisted as only a cat can twist, but, instead of poising herself to fall on her feet, she thrust herself away from the stone, imagining Broken Axe watching her arc overhead with a blank stare. The outer branches of the pine tree whipped at her, and her weight shattered them as she half leapt, half fell. Then she hit a branch that was solid enough to bear the small tiger that she had become. She, fail she flailed madly at the bark, claws digging in wherever they could, the trunk bent under her, but she gave it no time to realize the lunacy she had inflicted upon it. She scrabbled and scratched up another six feet, shifting her weight to lean in towards the cliff, and then let the tree spring away as she jumped again. Below her, Broken Axe jumped away from the explosive shower of snow she released. <clears throat> this time she had spotted her target, 
The higher reaches of the cliff were riven and messy with roots and grass. For a moment she thought that only one set of claws had caught, not enough to keep her anchored there. But then, both hind feet had found just enough roughness in the rock to boost her up, and it needed only three heaving breaths' work to see her over the top. She turned, then, to look down. It was not exactly a gesture of defiance, and when she collapsed into a crouch it was because she was shaking too much to run any further. Still, she faced her hunter, and, in doing so, shook off the role of prey, at least for now. The pale wolf that was broken axe looked up at her. She had thought he would step to his human form and try to coax her back again, but there was just the beast below with his pale eyes and dark shoulders. He sat back on his haunches and stared, and she tried to read many things into the language of his lean body, and could not be sure of any of them. Then he stood and shook himself and trotted off along the line of the cliff, his intention plain. It would take more than the intervention of the earth itself to put him off his hunt. She thought about trying to climb down then, but he was still there, somewhere below, and, if she thought of it, so might he have second-guessed her, as he seemed so apt at doing. Instead, when she had recovered her breath, she turned and set off again, away from the fractured side of the earth. She returned to her wolf shape, but by now she had no clear destination left to her. The pursuit itself was the only thing that was keeping her moving. When she grew tired, worn down by covering the broken ground, she sheltered wherever she could find, hunching in whatever nook the land would give her, under rock shelves or in the wind shadow of trees. Hesperick made no appearance, having stowed himself back in her satchel. She felt as lonely and lost as if she was the last soul on earth. Sometimes she went uphill, because she hoped Broken Axe would assume she would go down. Sometimes she went downhill, because she was tired and it was easier, and she was not thinking. The wind remained cold, but the snow did not return, and the weakening sun began to eat into that which had already fallen, slowly restoring the world to her, and erasing her tracks. On the third day, Broken Axe still not having caught up with her erratic wanderings, she broke into the clearing, and halted. In one sinuous movement, Hesperick unwound himself from her satchel, and stepped into his old man's body, drawing his robe tight about him. What is this place? He hissed, one hand making a quick gesture at the sight ahead of them, as if to ward off some hostile and very present power. She had been running tired for some time, her head low, implacable feet drawing on her on despite the bone weariness in her limbs. She had not noted all the stumps of felled trees that had lined her path towards this place. She had not realized that... Out of the domain of the wilds, she had come to a place of man. There were no men here now, though. The start of winter had driven them lower to warmer ground. She wondered if they were thralls of the winter runners, or if she had wandered close to some other pack's territory, the moon eaters, perhaps. Whichever, this was wolf tribe work. No others did this. Here, the felling of trees had cleared a great circular space containing the wreckage of a dozen mounds. Where the snow had melted, she could see the char of ash left behind, and there was plenty of half-burned wood scattered about, the shell that had been peeled away when the thralls had dug at the treasure within. She had always known that the wolf had marked her, and probably as prey. Here she felt his presence keenly, his spirit lingering even after his work was done. When she stepped again, exhaustion fell on her like a hammer, and she sagged to her knees. This is a sacred sight. She felt that she should be very scared to intrude here, as Hesperd, as a Hesperic might be, for certainly he had sensed the god of his enemies hanging about the place. Instead, though, she felt unnaturally calm. The wolf was watching her, but had yet to bare his teeth, and she was too sapped by her long run to show either deference or defiance. What do they do here? The old serpent asked, eyes narrowed. She should not tell him, she knew. No child of the wolf should divulge such secrets. But the rebellious streak that had driven her so far flared up again, and she looked the invisible wolf right in its eye and said, This is where they make the magic wood. 
Calamishly has scores of thralls employed for it. They do something special in the burning of it, and this normal wood becomes magic wood. The wolf's wood. She glanced at him to see what he might make of that, and noticed a thoughtful expression under the shadow of his hood. This is the iron magic? He guessed. It is the iron magic, she confirmed. She did not know the secret, of course. Only Kalameshli and his acolytes, and their counterparts in other tribes, could claim that knowledge. She knew the magic was only the wolf's to use, though, a secret knowledge that had seen her father's people cast down her mother's, and that no outsiders must ever know. The iron was that unnatural, terrible metal that made tools that could shatter stone and weapons that could crack bronze, iron that no man could attune himself to and carry with him while stepped, without going through terrible ordeals as secret as the metal's working. Your god is here, Hesperk's voice seemed remarkably steady. Or one of them, at least. How does he look upon you? Tell me. Wolf filled the clearing, towering high as the sky, his sightless paws planted as far apart as the furthest trees. She felt his vast attention on her, watchful and considering. Well, O oh wolf, she asked inside her head, speak to me of your disapproval. She knew the stories of those who betrayed the pack, hearth husbands who were greedy when food was scarce, chiefs who led their people astray, hunters who were clumsy or overproud, kinslayers, most of all kinslayers. In the stories, they found themselves in the wilds, and they came face to face with wolf, and they were judged. There were many qualities Wolf despised, but many that he valued, too. Not all his people ran with the pack. Some walked alone, after all. Wolf weighed her and scented her and marked her trail. All of her trail all the way back to Akrit's Hall, and she felt no condemnation. Not yet. Wolf was waiting to see how she would survive. Now she had cast herself into the wilderness. She would know his judgment. It would be expressed in her living until spring, or in her frozen corpse being buried by the winter's snow. Wolf despised betrayal and cowardice, but she felt neither of those rods descending upon her back. Instead, she knew that Wolf valued determination and perseverance, the endurance of the long chase, the will to survive the lean season of the ice. He is waiting, she said softly. He wants to know what I will do next. Hesperk sighed and sat down beside her, stiffly enough that she heard his joints creak. And what will you do? Survive. The word came to her unbidden. Excellent. Always it is good to have a plan. <clears throat> she glanced angrily at him, but saw the slight smile there the sign that he was baiting her. And you have a plan too, O oh serpent? It may be so. This is not my land, but these things are known. What we have just lived through was the least hatchling of winter's brood, no? When the season comes in earnest, we will die. He saw her stubborn expression, and amended that to, I will die. Of that I am sure. I hear no plan, she told him curtly. We are reaching the far bounds of your people here. I had always thought that the highlands were not wolflands. The wolf walks where he wills, she replied archly. But then, I think we must be at the very edge of the wolf's shadow here. This camp may even mark it. The wolf wood takes much normal wood to create, I think, 
so the camps are far and spread. Hesper closed his eyes and bowed his head. Let us shed north, then. Further north? she asked, wide-eyed. North, into the high lunch proper, he confirmed. Use that nose of yours to sniff out some habitation that is not wolf tribe. Let us claim some right of hospitality, and hope that whoever dwells here is kinder to a wandering priest than your kin were. Seek out the scent of smoke, and let us then trust to the power of words to win us a place for the winter. That is no plan, she decided. It is my only plan, and yours is. She tried to sense what the wolf might think. Was it craven to creep into some stranger's good graces just to ward off the chill? Should she not brave the utmost winter to show how she was the wolf's child? Except that she was not the only wolf's child, and, anyway, even the wolf told stories of the clever, as well as the strong and the swift. Wolf valued the crafty, even as he valued the mighty. She half felt that Hesperk's suggestion was doomed anyway. Surely they could wander all over the highlands and not find a single campfire kept burning. But there was no harm to scent the wind for the taste of smoke, after all. In the end, even if the wolf did disapprove, she wanted to live. A stranger's hearth was better than a cold grave. It rained soon after, adding a new misery to the rest. As well as the wet chill that soaked into her pelt, they had run out of the food gifted to them by the horse, and the hunting here was meager. With the world's sense washed away and its creatures under cover, they might as well be in a desert for all the prey she could scare up. This time it was Hesprek who saved them, setting little traps of thread unpicked from his robe edge so that a dozen little small creatures, squirrels and mice, were caught overnight while they slept. The serpent has other ways to be fed than all this chasing about, he explained in that manner of his that trod the line between dignity and self-mockery. He kept a single mouse for himself and let her take what meat she could from the rest of the diminutive catch. His own meal he swallowed whole and raw, stepping into his snake form to digest it. He had explained that he could live for a week on such a repast, if he needed. She had not thought she would come to rely on him. In the pit of the winter runners, he had seemed such a frail and helpless creature. Later, it snowed again, overnight, so that the white world was waiting for them once more when they awoke. By then, Manny felt her ribs tight against her skin, her skin loose over her shrunken belly. She could not live on a mouse every handful of days, nor could Hesperk save himself from a freezing death without her wolf warmth each night. Their codependence would not be enough to beat back the encroaching winter. But that very same day, even as the sky was purpling, bruising down towards sunset, she scented smoke. The taste of it. That lone evidence that she and Hesperk were not the sole surviving humans in the whole of the world set her feet bounding and scrabbling through the snow, even as a fresh feathering of white began to descend. Someone had lit a fire. A fire meant warmth. A fire meant food. A fire meant home. Right then she was prepared to kill a stranger for those things, if only she found the strength for it. She was not so maddened with hunger that she just went charging right in. When she spotted the fire's red eye, deep off in the forest, she stepped to her human form and shook her satchel until Hesperk awakened and slung his coils out, spitting and cursing at the chill the moment he resumed his bony old human shape. A simple pointing finger was enough to bring him up to speed. A campfire, I think, he murmured, squinting into the twilight. 
some other wanderer, perhaps, who would be abroad this night, the dangerous and the desperate, none other. You're having second thoughts? she demanded. He tucked his gloved hands under his armpits. Let us go anyway, and hope they are dangerously hospitable and desperate for company. On these feet? she asked, meaning, in these shapes? It would seem best, he agreed weakly. I mean no slight. But who welcomes a wolf to their fire? They approached carefully, treading as lightly as possible through the snow and squinting into the dark at the burgeoning reddish glow that was fast becoming the focus of their world. Many had thought of stepping to her tiger form to scout the stranger's camp, but if any of the firemakers were resting in an animal shape, then they might pick up her scent. Worse, if she was spotted skulking about the edges of their camp, and if one of them had a bow or even a good spear arm. Closer, and a tantalizing scent of cooking drifted to them. Fish was not common fare in Akrit's Hall, but even a human nose could not mistake it. Do the rules of hospitality hold so far to the north? murmured Hesprick. He had withdrawn his arms entirely from the sleeves of his robe, huddling his way along with them wrapped inside about his skinny body, and in constant danger of falling over. Only one way to find out, many realized, but her own teeth were now chattering too much to say it. The fire had been set in a hollow cleared of snow, to hold in as much of its heat as possible, so they were obliged to creep very close before they could get sight of its master. When they did... Lifting their heads over the dip's edge, Manny caught her breath in shock. The fire itself had been laid with a half cairn of stones to shelter it and to direct its heat. The structure was constructed intricately, a veritable work of art in dry stone, each piece interlocking with its neighbors elegantly, and all the more remarkable because its builder was a giant. Even sitting at the fire, he would have been able to look at he would have been able to look Manny directly in the eye. Standing, he would have loomed at least head and shoulders over Hesprick, and, rather than being lanky like the snake priest, he was massive, vastly broad across the shoulders, wide at the waist, lumpy with muscles like boulders. He wore a robe of overlapping, stitched-together hides, and the garment itself probably weighed more than Manny could lift, perhaps even with Hesprick's help. Over that, he had a cloak of coarse wool that would have made a tent for a man of more modest proportions. His black hair was long, plaited into two thick braids that rattled with bone rings alongside his cheeks. His beard was the size and shape of a spade head. At his side sat a pair of muscular grey dogs, wolf-like, but most certainly not wolves, and behind them, covered with a skin, was a sled. The dog's attention was entirely fixed on what their master was doing. He sat cross-legged with a fist-sized ball of earth before him, and with a gentle tap he cracked it open, revealing a curled fish inside that had been cooked in the heat of his fire. The smell was unbearably delicious. Manny spared a glance for Hesprick, who was plainly not going to last much longer without that fire. For herself, she felt that she would not last much longer without the fish. Her stomach made the decision and pushed her forwards, one hand snagging the old priest's flapping sleeve to draw him after her. As they half-stepped, half-slipped down into the hollow, she expected the huge man to leap up, outraged at these intruders. But apparently the two of them were not so very alarming as all that. Instead, their hoped-for host leant back, one eyebrow raised quizzically, and one hand moving over to rest easily on the haft of an enormous axe she had not noticed before. It was as long as she was tall, with a head of copper held to its arm-thick shaft by three sockets, and yet it seemed barely adequate for the man's huge hand. "'What's this now, whom?' 
That last was a sound from deep in the man's throat, a growl that sent a shiver of fright through Manny's bones. His voice was very soft, just as his stance was very calm and still, but there was a well of strength behind both. Manny had no idea how to address one of the cave dwellers, for he could be nothing else. The sheer bulk of him had struck her silent, mouth opening, but her words failed to venture forth. Kind lord, came Hesperk's voice at her ear, we are but travelers in this land, who saw your fire from afar, as if it were a star to guide us. His voice shook and shuddered from the cold, but he managed a stiff bow, and many wondered if this was how people actually talked where he came from, or whether he was just making things up again. The cave dweller grunted. Even I, Hesperk went on, gamely, desperately, who first saw the sun in a land far distant, have heard of the welcome generosity of these, your cold lands. Wherever life is harsh, there life is precious, is what they say. Even for two strangers such as we. The huge man raised a hand abruptly, and Manny found herself flinching back from him, even though he sat halfway across the fire from them. Share the fire, why don't you? He suggested quietly, with a touch of exasperated humor. Leave all those words out in the dark, though. Now it was Hesperk who was lurching forwards and dragging Manny after him, almost falling into the fire in his eagerness to get warm. Once he was sitting, shivering uncon uncontrollably, she reached over and pulled his robe open a bit against his protests, so that the fire's heat could get to him through all those layers. Their host poked at the fire with a stick and excavated another clay lump. The look he gave his guests was distinctly put upon, You'll be hungry, of course. All sorts of cold and hungry. He looked mournfully at the ball before him. For him, they were very small fish. I will survive, Heshbrick said. But my friend has been doing much of the walking. He pressed on with sudden abandon. I am Heshbrick Eschenskish, a priest much respected in, in my own land, and the girl here is Manayi. The exchange of names was an essential element of the bond between host and guest, as everyone knew. The big man stared at him for a moment, his sullen expression almost a child's. Then he shrugged. Loud thunder, he rumbled, striking a fist at his chest. A hunter name was better than nothing, many ye knew, although not quite so potent as a birth name. There were six more fish still in the fire, and they were able to watch the precise tilting of greed and conscience in Loud Thunder's face as he cracked the earthen balls all open and considered how to divide the spoils. In the end, Hesperick got half of one, Manayi the other half and the smallest one of the remainder. Two went to the dogs, the huge man filled in the fish nearby with a thin blade of flint and then letting the animals snap and squabble over the meat. Nobody complained. The taste was surprisingly rich, flavored with the herbs the fish had been wrapped around before being encased in clay. Loud Thunder watched them as he ate, his knuckle-sized teeth making surprisingly delicate work of it. His expression was a little puzzled, a little resentful, but mostly that of a man without judgment. Then, just as Hesperk had finished picking flesh from bone, one of the dogs lifted its head from the last scraps of its food. Ears pricked high. Who is it that travels with you? 
Loud Thunder growled suspiciously. For a moment, Manny could not understand what he meant. A second later, she knew, without any doubt, who it must be. In a thought, she became a tiger, turning away from the fire as she stepped, her keen eyes paring away the darkness, hunting out what the dogs had sensed. There was a man out there, standing still as a tree amongst trees, and it was Broken Axe. There was no mistaking him. His image was branded on her mind. The shock of seeing him jolted her back into human form, and she turned to see the cave dweller staring at her with almost comical surprise. Please, she got out. Please, we are being hunted. There is a man out there, a killer. He is sent by my father to murder me. Please. Loud Thunder's expression told her that this went beyond any contract between host and guest, and his great head shook slightly. Then, Broken Axe, human still, stepped carefully into the firelight, with his hands empty. The cave dweller's hand was resting on his axe again, but with no obvious intention of using it. Manny felt her innards freeze up, the fear clenching her there hard enough to hurt. Please, she forced out. He killed my mother! Please! He killed my mother! Now she had the absolute attention of all three men as the wolf hunter approached. Well, Loud Thunder murmured, taking a deep breath. For one mad moment, she thought he would take up his axe and defend her, stranger though she was. She had a dream vision of that heavy copper blade cleaving through the wolf without slowing, just a single blow that would end forever her nightmares and her running. Then the cave dweller nodded. Axe, he hailed the newcomer with evident familiarity. Thunder, replied Broken Axe, and, at a small nod from the big man, took a place at the fire. And that concludes chapter number 14. So, we saw Asmander and his crew of horse, and now Coyote, have a run-in with the Eerie Men, the birds of the north. And now we see Manny Yi run into a cave dweller. Now, a cave dweller is just another word for a bear. So that man being as huge as he is, Loud Thunder, he is indeed a bear when he steps. And... Now Broken Axe pops out of nowhere, and it seems as if they know each other. So that's going to be quite curious. We'll have to see how Manny can deal with that one to see if they gang up on her, or if something else transpires. So make sure you stay tuned and show up again next week, 12 o'clock on Friday, to find out what happens to them. So I look forward to seeing you then, and until that time, enjoy your weekend. Bye now.